Hello and welcome to Friday Beyond Spotlights, a new insightful program looking into the lives of Hong Kong's most remarkable high achievers and getting their take on the city's past, present and future. Our focus is to connect to our audience with compelling and authentic content. We feature guests with insightful perspectives for a new generation, living in a fast-paced and constantly evolving city. So let's inspire Hong Kong for a better society. These distinguished personalities will divulge their inspirational stories that will encourage and motivate us. So sit back and relax. Together we'll go beyond the spotlights. Welcome to Friday Beyond Spotlights. This is Patrick Zhang, your host. I'm a proud Hong Kong businessman, entrepreneur and philanthropist. On Friday Beyond Spotlights, we invite prominent guests to share their insights on current affairs, business, innovation, and culture. Today, we're very honored to have the Honorable Mr. C.Y. Leung. C.Y. is Vice Chairman of the National Committee of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference and former Chief Executive of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. Welcome to Friday Beyond Spotlights, CY. Hello, Patrick. As one of the leaders of Hong Kong, you have always contributed to the success of the city. On the business side, as an international city, Hong Kong is constantly ranked as one of the world's top 10 trading hubs. What is Hong Kong's special fundamentals that would allow us to have such high trading volume? Trade has always been as part of Hong Kong's uh, DNA. Uh, you probably remember that somewhere around Xiangwan district on Hong Kong Island, mm. we have an area known as Nam Bak Hong, yep. uh, North-South Trading Zone, or the Hongs of Hong Kong. You're probably too young for that. But I can still remember as a young child in Hong Kong 60 years ago, uh, that, that was the waterfront of Hong Kong. Now, obviously, the shoreline has been sort of pushed out. Uh, what did they do? They still do that, actually. There's trade between the north and the south of this part of the world. Uh, the north is anywhere north of Hong Kong, and that will include Guangzhou, the capital city of Guangdong province. And the south is essentially the Southeast Asia today, and the Nanyang. And they traded in everything that the two sides uh, had to offer each other. Um, and um, Hong Kong bought goods that they were not needed by Hong Kong locally. And Hong Kong sold goods that were not produced uh, locally. So we had always been uh, somewhere in the middle uh, doing trade. And now uh, today we uh, call them re-export. And some of the trades actually were not re-exported uh, by Hong Kong because the goods never touched the shores or the airport of Hong Kong. Um, and, and Hong Kong does a lot of what we now call offshore trade, meaning we buy uh, from um, a supplier and the supplier will send the goods direct to the destination, which is not Hong Kong. Uh, that's offshore, offshore trade. Niri, do you know that in 2020, Hong Kong's GDP was 2.7 trillion, but our trade volume was about 8.2 trillion? That's amazing. Quick calculation in my head tells me that Hong Kong's trade volume is three times that of our GDP. So that means there must be advantages for companies to trade through Hong Kong. Trade is still a very important sector of Hong Kong's economy. And, and we trade in uh, all sorts of things. Uh, for example, we're one, one of the biggest, we are the biggest buyer of uh, Japanese foods for 13 years uh, running. And that's a, a piece of official uh, Japanese uh, statistic. And all these Japanese products, are they consumed locally or they might not be? Part, cons part is consumed locally. Hong Kong people like uh, Japanese foods. Uh, but a larger part uh, is actually sort of sent uh, from Hong Kong after they arrived here uh, to other parts of the world, particularly the mainland of China and Southeast Asia. But more interestingly, some of these quote-unquote imports uh, of Hong Kong, of Japanese uh, uh, foods, uh, never arrived in Hong, Hong Kong because they are sent direct from uh, Japanese suppliers to the final destination. So in many ways, I think even on the business side, uh, some companies actually do not have operations in Hong Kong, but they trade through Hong Kong, they do their deals in Hong Kong, and they might even resolve their disputes in Hong Kong. Exactly. Uh, Hong Kong is one of the largest, if not the largest, trading hubs of wines, grape wines. 
Hong Kong doesn't produce it, obviously. What we do is actually sort of sell wines for other people and buy wines for other people. And now that the Ningxia uh, Autonomous Region of China is now fast becoming a major and a very good wine producing country, um, Hong Kong's um, wine trading hub is becoming more significant and prominent. Nuri, do you know that China is the largest grape producer in the world? Ma. Just in Ningxia alone, there are several hundreds of vineyards, which is at a similar latitude as France's Bordeaux wine region. I did not know that. Well, I'm doing my part to help the economy. Gambe. See why if we then expand a little bit on our conversation to the Greater Bay Area, if we're looking at international businesses or talents, right, if they want to position themselves to take advantage of opportunities in the GBA, what advice would you give them? Firstly, the GBA cluster of nine cities in Guangdong province and the mainland of China, together with Hong Kong and Macau SARs, uh, form one of the three major economic clusters of cities uh, in the entire uh, country in, 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 in China. Uh, Hong Kong is a very useful uh, base for foreign enterprises, big and small. Uh, to break into the uh, GBA market in, mm. uh, in Guangdong province, which has a, a, a rising and pretty high uh, buying power. Uh, average income level in these nine cities on the mainland uh, are, are actually quite high. So, um, and, and, and it's very easy to establish and run a business in Hong Kong. I mean, the typical thing I say uh, to prospective uh, foreign companies to be based in Hong Kong is that you only need to send from your home country a young manager, you hire an assistant in Hong Kong, you hire a driver in Hong Kong, you hire a secretary in Hong Kong, and then the four of you could sort of cover the entire GBA uh, cluster of cities on a daily commute basis. I do all those jobs already. I wonder if I can cover the Greater Bay Area all by myself. That would be great. With a low tax rate, you can contribute to Hong Kong's GDP. So see why the GBA area also boasts geographical advantages, right? In terms of how Hong Kong is positioned versus some of the other cities. Could you also comment uh, from the logistical perspective what benefits we have in the GBA area? There's, a there's been very heavy uh, public and private investments in infrastructure in the entire uh, GBA uh, region. For example, the uh, uh, high-speed train service between Hong Kong and these uh, cities. I mean, you're talking about half an hour, an hour uh, coverage of uh, most of these uh, cities in the uh, uh, Guangdong province of uh, the GBA, um, and also uh, roads, tunnels, and airports, etc. And, and, and so, uh, seriously, when one could cover most of these cities on a daily commute basis, uh, either driving or uh, riding on the uh, high speed train. Nuri, are you aware of all the recent developments in the Greater Bay Area? Have a look at this map. These five bridges form an A and easily connect to the area for better access. Yeah, you know, I love how the GBA has a, a well developed transportation network that connects all the cities in the region. Yes, these roads, tunnels, and bridges in the GBA are connecting cities, people, businesses and great minds. It's like elements coming together and creating new alloy, which is better and stronger than anything we have seen before. What role can the GBA area play in terms of promoting overall Chinese culture, both within Hong Kong and China, as well as, of course, overseas? Now, firstly, if you look at Hong Kong, um, because of the history of Hong Kong and because of the fact that we practice, so to speak, the other system within the one country to systems arrangement, we are a very good super connector, not only in terms of trade and investment, financial services, but definitely in terms of promoting cultural interchange between, um, I, I know it's quite a thing for, uh, to say for a city of, of only 7.5 million people, uh, but Hong Kong does have that very effective role of being the super connector also in cultural activity between um, this is the punchline, uh, the rest of China and the rest of the world. Maritime activities is also something that our country is very focused on. 
do you believe the GBA area also has a role to play in terms of promoting maritime services? Definitely. Firstly, if we look at uh, port activities, I mentioned uh, Nansha is a fast uh, rising uh, container port. We also have the Shenzhen port in Yantian and uh, uh, Circle. Uh, Hong Kong uh, has a major port um, as well. Uh, but Hong Kong is moving slowly away from just container port activities, where, meaning sort of moving boxes around, uh, into what uh, London, for example, as a major maritime hub. And contrasting uh, port activities, we are now talking about sort of desk-based uh, activities, activities, not necessarily shore-based activities, uh, providing services in the sale and leasing of ships, the registration of ships, the insurance of ships, the financing of ships, and uh, all the legal services that go uh, with um, um, the activities that I uh, previously mentioned. If we're talking to the aspiring young men and women of both Hong Kong and mainland, if they want to build a career in the GBA area, what advice would you give them? Well, firstly, I very much envy the, uh, the new generation. I often say to them, I, I could swap my life with uh, the life of any of our youngsters in Hong Kong, uh, someone in, in, in college, in secondary school, I would, um, because um, they have the definite advantage of being young, energetic, living in Hong Kong as a vibrant city, which is part of a rising country called China. There is so much that could be done, not just um, uh, for their own career development purposes, but also for uh, forging international collaboration between China and um, other parts of the world. Thank you, CY, for your comments. The next part of our program, Beyond Spotlight's Story, we ask our guests to talk about an object or an episode in their life that has special significance to them. Is there an object or an episode in your life that has special meaning to you? Let me show you the object first. This is my school bag, which I bought during a Christmas sale uh, from this otherwise quite expensive uh, British department store in um, Bristol, England. Uh, and I paid £2.99 uh, for it, and that was 1974, 48 years to be exact, uh, which I've been using as my uh, school bag when I was in uh, the Bristol. And ever since I came back to Hong Kong, I've been using it as my, as my uh, briefcase. It's still in my study or in my office. That's uh, wonderful. Nowadays. Uh, I paid, as I said, uh, two pounds uh, ninety-nine, which was nearly um, what I was paid working as a part-time helper in a Chinese takeaway, come fish and chip shop in in Bristol. Now, t uh, tell us more about that part of your life. Um, my family gave me a one-way ticket to England, which was uh, expensive, and then gave uh, pay. Uh, my uh, tuition fees, and then gave me uh, one year's worth of uh, living expenses. And then I, I decided to uh, do some part-time uh, work so that I don't have to rely entirely on my uh, family going forward. Uh, I was introduced to this um, Chinese fish and chip and takeaway shop, and I worked uh, behind the counter. Uh, for six hours an evening on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays, and I was paid uh, three pounds fifty um, a night. So I made uh, ten pounds fifty uh, for working three nights a week. And uh, we also sell sold things like uh, swine sour pork, swine sour chicken, chop suey, and curry uh, sort of thing. And uh, the business was good. Life was a bit uh, challenging. As a young man from Hong Kong, away from your family, um, having to speak English all the time, uh, what were some other challenges that you faced? Well, um, I didn't mind the, the climate, um, but the cost of living in England, the inflation uh, was, a, was a challenge. Um, but it was a, a very meaningful uh, three years. Now, this is what I say to young people as well in Hong Kong. Um, the level of education in Hong Kong, tertiary education, Sangri, are actually very good. But I still encourage them uh, to study overseas because, because as a student, 
uh, you have an ex extended period of time, let's say three, four years in, in, in college, and then you have more time uh, to spend with um, your peer group, in people who are also in their formative years, so that you can really sort of broaden your, your, your minds to how other people live and how they see things. And, and that, um, although it was, a, it was tough and I had to sort of uh, uh, juggle between uh, two jobs, one as a student, the other as a, a helper in a shop, um, it was hard. I walked to uh, school uh, every day and it took me 55 minutes to be exact in the British uh, weather. Um, but it's very meaningful, very, 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 uh, very uh, rewarding uh, three years. Wow, walking for 55 minutes every day to school in UK's freezing weather to save on bus fare. Those years must have been tough as a struggling student balancing a part-time job faced with school fees and living expenses. This definitely builds character. From humble beginnings to, to where he is today, quite a journey. It's an episode in your life, I believe, that you've also learned a lot in terms of, you know, to call it Western culture or yes. the British culture. Yes. Um, what did you bring back to Hong Kong from that experience, right? An understanding of um, the British people, British culture and the British way of life and the British political and social systems, uh, for example. So it's not, so it's not just... Um, what you learned in, in classrooms, and provided you're prepared to sort of open your mind up and open yourself up uh, to, to the local people, you actually learn a lot. Now, we now live in a very globalized world, and our understanding of uh, people and things outside of your own uh, local community, community outside of your own uh, comfort zone, I think is very important uh, to young people, particularly this day and age and you've maintained the friendships of the relationships that you've made during the period of time? Oh, a lot. My, um, my old uh, employer in this uh, fish and chip shop and, and also uh, neighbours in this small district in uh, Bristol called Fish Ponds. Um, and I went back um, del deliberately three, four times to go down uh, memory lane. Uh, and I um, sort of looked up my British neighbours every now and then um, and uh, before some, uh, some of them were already elderly when I was a student. Before they passed away, um, we corresponded, uh, cor corresponded with each other uh, regularly. And those three years were definitely good training for you um, from very simply how to take care of yourself and then a much broader outlook in terms of opportunities and Very goals. good training and also very uh, rewarding as well. And it's something that I highly recommend uh, young people in Hong Kong to do. I mean, you have a you have very good education, you have a good, de good degree in Hong Kong, uh, but going away, live in a faraway place uh, by yourself um, for a few years in a totally foreign environment uh, is very, very enlightening. And in many ways, I think, see why that's also a characteristics of um, people in Hong Kong. Uh, a number of us do have that overseas education experience and I think that can definitely contribute to um, our influence in terms of promoting cultural exchange which is very topical these days. Exactly, this is a very unique feature about Hong Kong. A lot of um, young people uh, in Hong Kong go away to, uh, to study in um, uh, other places and recently in mainland China uh, as well. Before that um, most people would go to the United States, Canada, Australia and England to, to study and most of them come back to Hong Kong and they bring back uh, their very unique experiences of life in these different countries um, and uh, I, I, I think we probably have, I don't have the access to uh, statistics but we probably have one of the sort of highest content concentrations of returnees from overseas studies uh, compared to other cities in the world. I, I can sense from your smile you do have very fond memories of that part of your life in Bristol. Yes. Um, any stories or any funny stories that you can share? Uh, I remember uh, exactly the moment when I got out of the train station uh, with my uh, suitcases full of these heavy books, uh, having to ask a uh, passerby 
uh, how to get to my uh, final destination, um, uh, where, where I would uh, stay, uh, a, a landlady's uh, uh, place. Uh, so uh, how do I get to fish ponds? Um, it was very helpful, but I couldn't understand much of what he <laughs> said because of the accident. Now, now straight away, you realize that you think you can speak and understand English. No. Uh, there are very different accents in different parts of uh, uh, a, a country, which is not uh, huge. But that probably gave you more momentum in terms of perfecting your English skills and truly try to understand what the culture is all about. Yes, and also to explore. And, and, and to sort of understand the similarities and dif differences uh, between peoples and places. Thank you very much, CY. That's a wonderful story. Thank you. In this part of the program, CY, we're going to get even more personal. Um, I'm going to ask you a few rapid-fire questions and just give me the answers as you think of it. Okay. Are you ready? Yes. Advice to your young self. Take in and take on the challenges and hardships in life. You'll be rewarded. What is the first thing that you notice when you meet someone new? Mm, his smile. What's the biggest compliment you've received? Being patriotic. How do you unwind? What's your hobby? Gardening. What's your favorite spot in Hong Kong? The harbor. Your favorite historical figure? Dr. Sun. If there's Anybody that you can have dinner with, dead or alive, who would you pick? I would say Mr. Deng Xiaoping, if I ever would have the honor. If you can say thank you to someone right now on the screen, who would you pick? My wife. What is the biggest sacrifice as a politician? Time and family. The last book you read? The Basic Law, actually, again. Your favorite place to eat in Hong Kong? Dai Pai Dong. The biggest misconception about you? Boring. Thank you very much, CY, for joining us today. Thank you. Now we have one more surprise for you. Oh, really? It's not as good as the ones in Bristol, but here's our version. Well, th thank you. Fish and chips. I'm sure this is 30 times more expensive than what I used to sell it. Does it I look like the ones you used to make? I think it's advanced. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate this. Stay tuned for upcoming episodes of Friday Beyond Spotlights. I'm Patrick Sang, your host, signing off. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Well done. Now, I've all had a chance to get to know CY Leung a little better, the man beyond the spotlights. It was a privilege to learn that someone with such a humble and frugal beginning can become so remarkable with tenacity and hard work. Thank you for watching Friday Beyond Spotlights. Until next time, goodbye.